Welcome to all those of you who are here for the first time experiencing our outdoor worship. I just want to, every time I come and experience something like this, I'm a little overwhelmed by just the power of the human spirit uh, to try and persevere and to try and figure this thing out um, as we work on how we're going to worship and do life as a church together. We thank you that this truly is a learning process and you can give us feedback and um, we also want to just express the gratitude for everybody who is willing to make this possible and just all the effort that it takes to do this so again thank you thank you for being here thank you for watching if you're online and we just appreciate all of you and I it's just a joy to look even at your eyes <laughs> this morning um, as we get ready to study God's word together so we're going to keep going. And this morning, we're going to look at a picture of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 9. We're going to look at a very famous story from the Bible. Um, it's a picture of the Mount of Transfiguration. And the story really comes at the very dead center of the Gospel of Mark. And maybe this morning, how we want to think of it is, remember when you're bowling? If you're a really good bowler, you don't look at the pins that are way ahead of you, but you actually look at those little markers, those little arrows, and you figure out how you're going to align your shot. Well, I think this story is really like one of those markers. Like, if we can put our focus on this story, then maybe it'll align us correctly for uh, the journey ahead. So with that, you can just listen along if you'd like, like that early church used to do, or if you got some way of reading, find that. And we're going to be in Mark chapter of our Lord. It says this, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before him, before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a loud voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead must have meant. I want to ask three questions of our picture of Jesus this morning. The first one is what were Peter, James, and John seeing when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration? The second is, what was Jesus trying to cultivate in Peter, James, and John while they were on the Mount of Transfiguration? And the final is, what was the emotion that they must have felt as they were going down that most holiest of mountains? Okay, so question number one, what were they seeing on the Mount of Transfiguration? And the short answer to that, I believe, is pure beauty. Now, to think about beauty at a time like this is challenging. In fact, I was challenged by this text this week to think in the midst of this hard time, in the midst of the week where I found out that my son is not going to go to a physical place to go to school. <laughs> um, and we sort of, again, just brace ourselves for the new news of what's ahead. And I'm sure every parent and every person <laughs> has uh, just experienced a little bit of that heartbreak as you receive the tough news time and time again. So how can we think about beauty? Well, I was one of the books I'm reading right now is about a wonderful uh, woman named Dorothy Day. 
um, and she had a movement called the Catholic Worker Movement, movement back in the day. And she had a tough life and she dedicated herself to working with the poor and she had many difficult experiences in her life, but her granddaughter found her journals and said in her journals that repeatedly over time she would write this one quote. And it was a quote by uh, Dostoevsky that said that the world will be saved by beauty. And to maintain that refrain in a time like this can be challenging, but I wonder if, too, as we look at our gospel story, and we think of really what was going on with Jesus, if maybe that's what Jesus was also pointing towards with this moment. You know, he had a difficult time uh, before he went up the mountain, and he's certainly going to have a difficult time as he goes back down the mountain, as he's headed into this passion narrative and headed towards the cross at the end of the book of Mark. But in between these two, there is a mountain. And on this mountain, what the disciples witnessed was pure beauty, the splendor of the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, one of the ways maybe we could illustrate this this morning came from our wonderful organist, Dr. James Hurd. Um, I don't know if you saw his Facebook post a week or so, a week or so ago, but he has this flower that he takes care of all year round, and it's called the Queen of the Night. And in his post. He talked about how he just so happened to get up at midnight on the one particular night of the year where this flower blooms. And it only blooms from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. And it only blooms randomly one night of the year. And so somehow at 12.30 he got up he must have had some intuition, went outside, and he got to see the queen of the night bloom. Now, only a man who has the patience and genius to learn how to play that organ that well would have a flower that you have to take care of every single day of the year only so that on the off chance you might be able to experience it in the middle of the night and he said well since i was able to see it i did stay for a little while and he said i can't even articulate to you the beauty and the splendor of this flower the disciples peter james and john got the rarest of rare glimpses of the beauty of jesus and they were able to see pure light. But they were not fully comprehending everything that they saw. They couldn't process pure beauty. They couldn't fully understand pure beauty. But they got a little picture of what Jesus really looked like on the inside. And we see the challenge for Jesus is one that's probably the opposite of the challenge for us which is that he wanted to take what was inside of him and let people see it. But what was inside of him was pure beauty. And so as he's standing on top of the Mount of Transfiguration and he's showing this pure beauty, the worry was that if it wasn't these three, that people would see it and they would be blind by it that they wouldn't be able to understand and comprehend who he truly was. And so he brings these three up because he thinks maybe these three can at least get a little glimpse and glimmer of the pure beauty of who God really is on earth. Okay, so what were they seeing up there? They were seeing a picture of what eventually would save them. The beauty of Jesus Christ, the same thing that will eventually save each and every one of us. That what leads us here, that leads us to do the strange things that we do here, to sing and to worship together and to paint and um, to, to bring ourselves together in, in such difficult times, ultimately is because we're still wooed by the beauty of the saving one, Jesus Christ. And so that's what they were seeing. They were seeing this marker on the way to the resurrection. 
this pointer to say that yes, even in the midst of it all, even in the midst of our difficult season that we are in, that where we're headed is towards beauty. And so may we always remember that our direction is, is to be pointed towards what is most beautiful and sacred in this world, and that's who we are, and that's who God calls us to be in the world as well. Okay, so that's the answer to the question, what were the disciples seeing up there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Second question, what was Jesus trying to cultivate inside of these three men as they're on the Mount of Transfiguration? What was he trying to teach them as their rabbi? And I think the answer to that question is resilience. Now we see again in this story that Peter steps up only to fail miserably again in this story. And not only that, he fails in a similar way that he did last week. If you were journeying with us last week, they were at Caesarea Philippi. And man, that is the valley. Caesarea Philippi is uh, was known for its pagan worship and for uh, having uh, many idols and being a place where Caesar worship and, and a cult-like worship was happening all of the time. And, and there, Jesus asks Peter the question and the disciples the question, who do you say that I am? And they say the prophets, some say the prophets, because that was a popu- popular belief at the time. Well, now here we are up on the mountain and we get to see Moses and Elijah. They're there on the mountain with the disciples and there they are in full display. And so the question again, the response from Jesus, I mean from Peter is, this is good. I don't know what it's about, but it is good. And we need to stay here as long as we possibly can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build three tents and we're going to stay here as long as we possibly can. Now many scholars point to the fact that this is probably an allusion to that story we studied last week at Caesarea Philippi because Peter still doesn't get it. He's still kind of thinking that Jesus is like the other prophets because he wants to build three tents and not one throne. He still doesn't understand fully what it means that Jesus is the Messiah, the saving one. So he wants him to say so again. He fails miserably even to the point where Mark the writer gives him some parenthetical excuse for why he made the mistake. If you read the story, you see in the story it says he's, he was afraid. He didn't know what he was saying. He keeps messing things up again and again and again. So why all this failure? Why does Peter fail time and time again? Well, I was reading a story I want to read to you that I help, helped me this week to kind of think about it a little bit differently. It's a story that begins uh, with a young man. It's a story of his life. And it's a story about a person who experienced more failure than probably any of us will experience in our life. So here this says this. At the age of seven, his family, this boy, was forced out of his home, out of their home on a legal technicality, and he had to start working illegally, of course, to support them. As if that wasn't enough grief for a small boy, at the age of nine, his mother died, and he had to be raised by his father. At the age of 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. He wanted to go into law, but his education wasn't deemed sufficient. At the age of 23, he went into debt to become a partner in a small store. Three years later, his business partner died, leaving him with a huge debt that would take years to repay. At the age of 28, he met the love of his life, and after four years of dating, they got engaged. Then, before they were married, she died unexpectedly. His friends feared that he might take his own life, and eventually he recovered after a nervous breakdown, only to make the bold decision to run for Congress. And then he lost. At 37, he got elected to Congress, but then he lost again after two years. At the age of 41, his four-year-old son died. Nevertheless, at age 45, he ran for Senate and lost. 
at 47, he made a bid to become vice president, but he got less than 100 votes. At the age of 49, he ran for Senate again and lost. Some people's lives are marked by failure. They can't catch a break until they do. And you've probably likely figured out this is the story of Abraham Lincoln, who at the age of 51 was elected president of the United States. After a life mostly marked by failure and disappointment, he took the office at the greatest moment of crisis in the nation's history. With this one success and the courageous decisions he made to get up and try again, he became one of the greatest leaders of our country. Lincoln was resilient. Failure did not destroy him, but rather prepared him for greatness. Resilience born out of tragedy is what saved our country in, its nation's, in our nation's darkest hour. And Lincoln isn't alone. That's Peter's story as well. Now we can say Peter was a total failure because he failed so many times, but true failure isn't about just meeting obstacles and, getting, uh, and falling down. True failure is about giving up in the face of those obstacles. And one of the things we see about Peter and Lincoln is that they do not give up. They stay by Jesus' side. And we can see even Lincoln had cultivated that type of faith in the midst of crisis. He said this once in the midst of some Union losses during the Civil War. He said, I have often found myself in a position where I find I have nowhere else to go but down onto my knees to pray. Have you experienced that in this season? That you've met so much resistance that eventually whatever ideas you were going to summon, whatever plans you were going to make, whatever uh, schemes that we thought would get us some control over the situation we find ourselves in have fallen short. And instead what we find ourselves in is ashes. We got to put a lot of effort. I, I know I put a lot. Of, I have a lot of meetings that turn to ashes <laughs> in this season because we planned one thing and then by the next week it was different. And man, our whole world has had that experience, you know, of trying to think we're going one way and ended up having to go another way and dealing with all of the ashes. Well, I love what the gospel and, and, and the scriptures say about ashes. That one day that our Heavenly Father will take these ashes and He'll trade them for His beauty. And so we can come still in the midst of our ashes, maybe through our prayer, through being down on our knees, in the midst of the ashes, having nothing but prayer, and, and, and just being prostrate before our Lord and desperate before our Lord, we can finally understand how God could give us His beauty instead of ashes. Because what's inside of us is still beautiful. And we worship a beautiful God even if we can't sing out loud. That doesn't make Him any less beautiful. And perhaps in the midst of our struggle, he sees us as more beautiful because he's cultivating within us a resilience. He's teaching us what we can take. He's showing us how strong we can be as a people. Okay, that's point number two. And then our final point this morning. What do you think they were feeling as they were walking down that mountain? Now, I don't know if you've ever been selected as a subset of a group where you were part of 12 or some group and then you got pulled aside to top three. Um, but usually that conjures some feelings of, wow, I I'm, I'm, must be feeling pretty good about what, how things are going with me. Like, I, I must be doing all right if I'm in Jesus' inner circle. You know, if I'm, I'm able to go and have this experience and even though they fell short and Peter messed up, he didn't get what the full picture was trying to say. Still, I bet he was walking down that mountain on that day thinking, man, I can't believe what I got to see. 
I can't believe what we just witnessed. Can you believe that we got chosen, just us three, to go and to see our heroes and then to go and to see who Jesus truly was and to then see that the voice and hear the voice of God come down and speak and to literally hear the voice of God speak to Jesus and say, this is my beloved one again in the midst of the story? They must have been so thankful. The theologian Meister Eckhart once wrote that perhaps the only prayer that we need to pray is the prayer, thank you. And that will be enough. And I think in times like this, when we get the right mindset, one of the things we can do is to be reminded of the places we can be thankful that we still have each other, that we still have family, that we have the ability to do worship in whatever form we get to do. We still have our children. We still have the heart beating in our chest that God gave us. And so in the midst of difficulty, we cultivate again this sense of, I'm still going, I'm still here. If all we say is thank you, that will be enough. That prayer is sufficient for all that we experience here. And so, the good news is, unlike the disciples, we don't have to keep this secret to ourselves. That we can move in a way from this place that still summons the divine creativity and beauty that call, God calls us to. And, still allows us the context by which we might fail striving together to understand our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he was fully about, knowing we're going to mess it up time and time again. But if we go to our knees, that what we get is strength and resilience and beauty for ashes. And then at the end of the day, when we cross the finish line, or maybe we never will, but we can still say we had our time. And we lived it with our God. And that we can be thankful for one another in the midst of it all. Will you pray with me? God, we, we pray this morning that you would cultivate in us what you were cultivating in Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. Would you give us a picture of your glory this morning that we would know that we are all headed for this glory. Lord Jesus, if we know you, Lord, you are in pursuit of us. You are coming to us, and so we just open ourselves. We open ourselves for your encouragement, for you to speak again your truth that we are your beloved children, and that your clothes of pure white, Lord, because of the cross, because of, um, because of who you are, and our desire to know you have come and they have covered all of the darkness within us and reconciled us to you, Heavenly Father. And so we receive the truth of the cross again this morning knowing that it moves us to ways of new life and being human uh, in light of the resurrection. And so we just pray you lift us up, that you would uh, just move in us. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you take hold of us? Would you fill us again, Lord? Um, would you outpour yourself in our midst? We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that uh, we get another chance to um, be with you today, to know you today. And I pray your blessing and protection over this group, Lord, um, as we go from this place, Lord, that uh, you would just be on them, Lord, and that you would protect them and care for them and minister to them throughout the week. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.